Hey people, it's Niaz talking. So, I'm going to be busy this week, so I wanted to cover a lot of ground and get this done. So, I'm covering slave revolts, specifically the ones that happened in America and Haiti. Now, I'm going off Claude Anderson's book, Dirty Little Secrets. So, check him out. He's a fountain of knowledge. So, we'll start with 1800, the Prosser Conspiracy. Now, the Gabriel Prosser Conspiracy was one of the nation's most carefully planned insurrections. Inspired by the successful Haitian revolt at the end of the 19th century, Gabriel Prosser, a 24-year-old rebel slave, sounded the dawning of the New Age Rebellion in America. After months of planning, Prosser arose leading a slave revolt against the city of Richmond, Virginia in August 1800. The black insurrectionists were instructed how to gather and use clubs, swords, and other objects as weapons. Prosser's intentions were to divide his rebel force into three columns. One to attack the penitentiary, which was being used as an arsenal, a second to capture the power station, and a third to attack the city itself. If the citizenry, citizenry refused to surrender, the rebel leader planned to kill all the whites. He would grant an exception to those he felt he had been somewhat kind to blacks, primarily Quakers, Methodists, and Frenchmen. The rebels aimed to gather large supplies of guns and powder and capture the state treasury. They calculated that when this had been accomplished, they would control the resources to hold off counterattacks for several weeks. The whole word of the slave revolt would then spread across the country, and the slaves from the surrounding territory would arrive to fortify their ranks. With a large enough revolt, they felt whites would have little choice but to come to terms with their demand for emancipation. On the day of the revolt, however, a severe Virginia storm washed out the bridges and roads, making it impossible for the 1,200-plus revolutionaries to get to the gathering point. Only 300 slaves showed up at a designated time. Prosser temporarily postponed the rebellion. On the Monday of August 30th, before Prosser could reschedule the undertaking, he was betrayed. Two Richmond slaves, Tom and Vero, informed their master about Prosser's plans. Once exposed, Prosser and 35 of his compatriots had little chance to escape. They were quickly surrounded, arrested, and tried. As was to be expected, Prosser and his fellow slaves were found guilty of revolting for freedom and executed. Long after Prosser was hanged, rumors hinted that between 2,000 and 50,000 slaves were ready to join his uprising. Many slaveholders were puzzled about the size of the Prosser's conspiracy and why so many slaves were willing to join. One theory suggested that the Virginia State Seal, which they depicted the mythological virtues standing over conquered Tyrannus had also motivated Prosser's support. The image on the seal, when impressed on the dark wax, could be interpreted as a freed slave standing triumphant over his master. Believing this state seal could, had motivated Black's revolt, many plantation owners hired guards at the capital and changed the official seal. Now, I want to have a bit of commentary on this. There's two things that stand out. The, uh, the betrayers, the two slaves informed on Prosa. They snitched, and this is another thing. Size does not always equal a good movement. If you look at the Black Panthers, they took in a lot of people. They, I think they even took in a Japanese guy. I can't remember what his name was, but the, the fact that they spread so wide allowed infiltrators into the movement, just as it did here. So that's the lesson for, the, for uh, people who want to do some things, you know, um socially progressive movements, they need to be careful who they allow in because a lot of people don't join intending to help. And what they said about the Virginia State Seal goes back to what people said about the statues. Now, people say it's just a statue. It wasn't a, uh, just a seal to them because they said it inspired the slaves to revolt. So, so it, it did have a very important effect, didn't it? That symbol to them symbolized freedom. Those statues, wherever they are, you know, it does, uh, I mean, I've seen them uh, in some of the statues in Kansas City and I think it was um, Missouri and other places, and I was in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, I've never been, but I've seen the photos of them. And they're all over the place. So they symbolize oppression. They symbolize the power of the racist structure and that's why they must be removed. They are more than just statues. Okay, now we've covered that and given a bit of commentary. Now the next one, the Denmark Vesey Uprising. In 1822, a few years after the Prosser conspiracy, Denmark Vesey, a militant free black, organized a revolt in Charleston, South Carolina. Vesey had purchased his own freedom for $600, which came from 1,500 
in lottery winnings. He was refused permission, however, to purchase the freedom of his children. Fueled by anger that his children, not to mention his race, were mere chattels, Vesey vowed not to accept the self-mocking, acquiescing behavior expected of slaves. He demanded that blacks display racial pride and courage. When he saw Charleston slaves bow, tip their hats, and step into the street gutters to make way for whites, he screamed, you deserve to be slaves. To express his anger in a more productive forum, Vesey became a Methodist minister who preached racial solidarity and freedom to his fellow blacks. Drawing on the text of the Declaration of Independence and the Old Testament in his sermons, he admonished against inequality and urged slaves to resist their masters. So vehement were Vesey's arguments that some of his followers feared Vesey more than their masters or even God. Vesey planned his uprising for nearly four years, patiently working out the details. He was well aware that several past revolts had gone awry when blacks squealed to their masters. To decrease that possibility, he let it be known he would personally deal with any slave who betrayed him. But even with all of Vesey's threats, how slaves informed their white masters, white masters of Vesey's planned revolt, not once but twice. Vesey never had a chance to carry out his threat of breaking the neck of any slave who informed on him. Based upon the word of slave informers, white authorities arrested and executed Vesey and 37 of his followers. Another 30 lesser participants were deported to the Caribbean islands for reconditioning. For Vesey, death was pr uh, probably uh, preferable to living with the knowledge that two of his own people personally profited from selling him down the river. For their treachery, the informers received meritorious manumission and monetary rewards. Okay, I want to have a bit of commentary on this. So, now, a lot of people often talk about slavery. One of the things that is evident is not always about money. Yeah, sure, it was sometimes it, the main basis of it was money, but here, even though he bought his own freedom for 600, now, assuming that a child, well, let's just say that they were children at the time, cost half an adult, right? That would mean enough money left over from his 1500 to buy free children. He was denied that. It wasn't about the money. It was about holding on to the power, being able to hold that over uh, Denmark Fessy and say, I have your children. What are you going to do about it? And here we see that he talked about racial pride and courage. Denmark Vesey, in actuality, is a forerunner of Marcus Garvey because he demanded that people display racial pride and courage and refuse to be subservient. And again, we see the same trend of treachery and these traitors in the movement being rewarded, quite sickeningly, for snitching. <sighs> okay. Now, this is the most famous one. And the chapter is titled, Nat Turner, Sword of God. Of all the slave revolts, Nat Turner was without doubt the best known. In August 1831, Turner and about 70 other black slaves began their long-planned insurrection. The charismatic slave believed the voice of God had instructed him to commence a death march across Virginia and the South to free four million black slaves. If necessary, he felt his band was justified in killing every white person who crossed his path. Nat Turner began the killing with his own master, then proceeded from farm to farm. Within a few days, he and his co-conspirators had raided several plantations and butchered no less than 30, 55 whites. The word of Turner's revolt immediately spread across the nation, throwing the white population into a panic. Many whites packed their families into buggies and fled Virginia and neighboring states. Haiti's successful slave revolt, which by this time was well known, made Turner's uprising white America's worst nightmare. To slave owners, Turner represented an out-of-control, avenging black boogeyman. As if that's ever changed. Okay, the federal government placed the United States Marines on alert. For two full months, thousands of state reserves and militia members scoured the state for Turner's small but mighty gang of revolutionary slaves. Furious that slaves had the nerve to actually take up arms against them, white vigilante mobs roamed the countryside, assaulting and slaughtering free or bonded blacks. In some cases, entire black families, women and children included, were massacred. Businesses and property owners conducted economic reprisals by refusing to deploy free blacks or rent them homes or farmland. Since white controlled private property, indeed the entire economy, their actions had serious repercussions on the black population. Turner's small army was eventually located, surrounded, and defeated. Turner and his men attempted counterattacks, but were vastly outnumbered. After going into hiding and eluding capture, he was finally discovered in a cave, arrested without resistance, tried, and hanged. Nat Turner had responded to the prolonged suffering of his people, 
At his trial, the black warrior looked at the sea of hostile white faces and said, I do not feel any guilt for what I have done, he declared. Let God judge my acts. His earthly judges found him guilty of seeking freedom. He was hanged and decapitated. So I want to do a bit of commentary on this. All right. Now, again, we see that two out of three of the slave leaders were preachers. And this is a very important thing. The church as it is now has been taken over by people who are liars, people who do not care about their congregations. Now, Turner and Denmark Vesey did not use the church as a place to gain their monetary wealth. They simply saw it as a stepping stone to elevating their people. And people must be very, very suspicious of these churches. You must never support them unless you, or any other religious organization, unless you look at them and say, well, what are you doing to help the people? Mm -hmm. uh, where else is here? Mm -hmm. Well, that's all I can say about that at the moment. Okay. Two, and the last one, whispers from a Caribbean nation. Toussaint Le Ouvertour, a former carriage driver and natural military genius, led the slaves of Haiti and the Dominican Republic in a rebellion against Napoleon of France at the end of the 1700s. Napoleon and his army suffered a stunning defeat. This was the only time in the development of the Western world that white Europeans blinked and blanks, blacks seized their freedom. More than 60,000 blacks and whites perished in Louverture's rebellion, creating Haiti as a republic of freed slaves. Following Napoleon's defeat, France sent troops to Haiti to negotiate a peace treaty. Although they had been militarily trounced, France's treachery was still alive and well. French military officials, displaying the flag of truth, managed to lure Louverture to their Haitian headquarters, where they arrested him in 1802. He died in the jail in the Alps in 1803. To stave off a chain reaction of black revolts in the United States, slaveholders tried in vain to keep the news of the Haitian revolt from the ears of black slaves. Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton had made an impact, reportedly wherever slaves chafed under chains, the man's name was whispered. Now, I want to do a bit of commentary. Now, Toussaint was different from the others, well, slightly different, in that he was a man of means, as, instead of being just a slave like, say, Nat Turner. He had some independent wealth, and initially, in the rebellion, he didn't join. What he did is he hung back and he waited to see what would happen. And although he didn't start the movement, that was Dirty Bookman. But later on, he emerged into it and seized control of the movement and led it forward to its successes. So, having independent means is very important because it gave, helped ha him have a springboard to become educated, to have a voice in the society, and when things began to move forward, to then place himself in a position to take control of the society's movements. Now, the three leaders of the American Revolution, American revolts, uh, Prosser, G Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner should be remembered as patriots, and Toussaint Louverture should be remembered as a patriot for the black race as well. And regarding Haiti, I plan to one day do a full-scale series of videos. I don't know when that will be, but I do intend to do that at some point. Anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed this commentary and learned something. But, uh, don't take this as the be-all, end-all. Read some books, look up some documentaries, keep researching and learning. Thank you. Please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. Peace.